that good? Yeah. All right, here I am. All right. So I always show this um, this slide after Kurt talks because I just want to acknowledge the really amazing work that happened in the 70s that led to the fact that we can get um, ocean color from space and that we can derive chlorophyll from it. So this was the early set of observations, the proof of concept um, that Kurt was talking about, and this is the percent of incident irradiance measured um, at high altitudes. And they were measuring, so as a function of wavelength, so hyperspectral, um, in the 70s. And they measured the percent of incident light at different altitudes. So this would be at 600 feet and this was 10,000 feet. And so you can see that as you go higher, the signal goes up. And why is that? That's the atmospheric contribution. And so that was the thing that people were thinking was going to get in the way because if you had so much signal coming from the atmosphere, how could you resolve any, you know, the 3% of the signal coming out of the ocean? But they, in fact, used that as a way of developing an atmospheric correction. And then these were, this was the percent of incident light after correction. This is the backscatter, what they call backscattered light measurement. We would call it radiance. Um, as a function of wavelength. And this was measured at the different places, um, the Sargasso Sea, and um, this is George's Bank here. And this is, this is the actual measured data that Kurt showed you some model data for, looking at how the slope, uh, the blue-green slope, changes as you increase the chlorophyll concentration from less than 0.1 to 3 milligrams per meter cubed. And so this was one of the pieces of, of uh, evidence that they used to justify the coastal, do coastal zone color scanner. So it really is um, pretty amazing work. So, um, and I just want to say that, it, you know, so Carl Lorenzen was the biologist on this project. And this was at a time when you could do really risky science and people were willing to fund you to take a chance on risky science. And these days it's gotten a lot harder. Money's gotten a lot tighter. And so if you talk to people who've been around for a long time, you know, like my postdoc advisor used to just write proposals and get, you know, enough money to fund his whole lab for five years. And I once saw a proposal from Howard Gordon that the title was something about ocean optics. And that was the title of his proposal. And again, it probably funded him and his whole program for five years. And the thinking was, well, yeah, of course. <laughs> He's going to do something amazing. And so let's just let's have some trust, because we know what's going to come out is going to be great. And nowadays, you pretty much have to have done a little, some little mini experiment to get results that you can prove to be able to write a proposal to get to do the work. And so I just, ONR used to be one of the places that funded really risky science, they would take a chance on, on ideas that maybe everyone said, there's no way you can get this signal through an atmosphere. Um, and thank gosh, you know, someone did. So anyway. Yeah, the Howard Gordon deal was when I was at ONR, and Rick Stenrad, who was my boss, recognized that whatever Howard Gordon does is going to be the definitive paper. And if we don't care if he publishes one paper a year, it's going to solve that problem. So we told Howard, send us a proposal for five years of funding, and it was titled something like Problems in Optical Oceanography, <laughs> and it I don't know, was like five pages or something. said, here's some things I'm thinking about working on, and we funded him for five years with one proposal. That would never in a thousand years happen today. Yeah. So. And half of the papers Howard famous for came out of that work. You mm -hmm. know? Yeah, so, but there's a lot more people in the field, and I think that that's, there's, so there's a little bit less money, and there's certainly less money per person, but I do think that in increasing the number of people in the field and increasing the different, you know, experiences and backgrounds of the people in the field, we are getting new ideas and different ways of looking at problems rather than the same five ways. And so there's, there's benefits to, to both systems, but I think, sort of what I like to call the democratization of ocean optics, I think, is, is moving us into directions of thinking about things in different ways, which is exciting because we'll solve different problems. Okay, 
So what I'm really supposed to talk about is semi-analytic inversion. Um, and um, so I've already talked about the forward model. And that's where we start with irradiance. And you're going to use hydrolyte. Actually, it's next week. I was thinking that this was, I originally thought my lecture was later next week. Um, and then, are you going to do the Monte Carlo? You're doing the Monte Carlo, right? Yeah. OK. Yeah. Yeah. So um, that's where you um, start with the radiometric measurements and you figure out, um, uh, or I'm sorry, you start with the IOPs and you figure out what the, the um, radiant field looks like. And then this is where we actually look at the tracks or we're measuring the um, apparent optical properties and trying to infer what the optical properties of the water are. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. We're trying to figure out the dragon. All right, so um, gosh, a number of years ago now, there was an IOCCG report on remote sensing um, of inherent optical properties. And there's, uh, and I, I really encourage that you look at this if you haven't already read it. It's got some really nice papers in there. And the one in particular that I, I'm going to talk about is chapter one. And it was written by Ron Zanefeld with contributions by Andrew Barnard and Jean-Ping Lee. And the title of it is, Why Are Inherent Optical Properties Needed in Ocean Color Remote Sensing? And so they talk about um, what had been you know, the de facto approach that if you have this radiance distribution from satellite and some black box that we call an empirical algorithm, a band algorithm or a neural network algorithm, you can estimate chlorophyll concentration. Or maybe you could just immediately go to primary production. Um, or maybe you could go to particle concentration. But that you weren't really sure why it worked, because it was basically an empirical relationship. And you know, so that's the basis of the chlorophyll algorithm. And their point was, and it's obvious, but I think it always bears repeating, that it's really that it's all of these different properties about particulate and dissolved matter that are impacting the IOPs. And that's what you've spent your first week thinking about. And that it's really the IOPs that are determining the radiance distribution. So in fact, what's missing in this black box is the connection between the properties that you want and the IOPs that they control and that it's the IOPs that are determining the radiance distribution in the spectrum. And so this is that missing link. So their point was that um, if you actually kind of go through all the little steps here, that allows you to think about you know, if your interest happens to be in non-living particulate organic matter, there is some relationship between that material and the radiance distribution that you measure. And what you need to do is find out what those connections are on each of these arrows. And that there's a mechanistic response. There's or a mechanistic relationship beyond just um, uh, a regression. OK. So this is the philosophical problem of empirical versus analytic modeling. Um, so we just heard about empirical models, and we're going to hear about more almost analytic but semi-analytic modeling. And it comes down to this. Empirical models, regressions, or machine learning neural network approaches, I think are incredibly powerful. And Kurt showed some really nice examples of them. And when I think about them, I think about them from the perspective of, do you need an answer? Do you need to know what the chlorophyll concentration is? Do you need to know that it's 2.3 versus 1.9? Because at 2.3, that triggers some sort of response for your management system. Or maybe it's triggering the onset of you know, migration of a species that you're interested in. You need to know what that value is. And you maybe need to forecast it based upon historical data you probably cannot do better than a neural network approach. It's giving you an answer. Right? Where the analytic approach comes in and becomes really powerful is if you want to understand how the ocean is working, if you want to understand what that underlying mechanism is that made your water red, 
or green or a slightly different shade of green today than it was yesterday. And if you want to be able to resolve any change in the ocean, then you really need to go more towards this approach because um, if, if neural network approaches or empirical approaches are based upon what used to happen and the relationships between chlorophyll and phycocyanin or the relationships between non-algal particles and CDOM, if those underlying relationships change because of climate change or because of trophic collapse or because of any of the large global scale changes that we're seeing, if those relationships that are the underpinnings of the neural network change, you're not going to see them because it's going to try to fit to what it has been trained on. And so in reality, what we need are both of these approaches. And that's why they're both like moving forward in both realms of empirical and analytic is so important because we need to know an answer, but we also need to recognize that the underpinnings or how, what we understand about the world is changing. Okay. So there's been a, a really nice paper came out by Jeremy and a bunch of people on the PACE science team um, uh, summarizing sort of our current, a current status of approaches for retrieving inherent optical properties from ocean color remote sensing and also identifying specifically what the current challenges are. And so I really recommend that you read this paper. It's just like one-stop shopping. It's just really a nice summary and really well-written um, and, you know, Kudos, particularly for the first three authors, for really making this happen. It's um, really um, a nice paper. So they have this nice figure in here. And just to kind of remind you, Kurt talked about this. But just to remember that there's radiances, normalized radiances, um, measured by the satellite at the top of the atmosphere. We also make measurements above the surface. And you guys did that in lab whatever, five, three, not three, um, this week. Uh, which is the water leaving radiance over the downwelling irradiance. Um, you can also measure things below the surface, <coughs> and you can measure the upwelled radiance as different from the water leaving, right? So it would be just beneath the surface. Um, and Or you could also measure irradiance, upwelling irradiance, and that has um, the symbols that they use. He uses, Jeremy uses, you know, to sort of distinguish. Is it a big R or a little R? Has it got a sub R or S? You know, there's all these different, like, who's going to use what symbol, but this is how they defined it. And the relationship between these two um, talks a little bit about that. And I think no, Kurt, Kurt covers that um, well, both here and when he talks about hydrolyte. Okay, so the point that they make is that these inversions can take a variety of different approaches, and I think that it's just worth identifying them. So you can get to the point where you measure IOPs, and they talk about the non-water IOPs because all of our IOP sensors are calibrated relative to water, or most of them are. So say you measure total absorption with the ACS. It's really the non-water absorption by an ACS. And then you could deconvolve it into particulate and dissolved. And maybe the particulate you could separate into phytoplankton and non-algal particles. And so there's a set of models that do that. Okay? So you're deriving component optical properties from measured total optical properties. Um, you can also go from the sort of the subsurface um, reflectance, or I'm sorry, the remote sensing reflectance here, and derive the total properties and then use a model to get there, right? Or you could directly derive these without going through the step of getting total backscattering and absorption. You could go right to component absorption. And so there's different models that do that. And then finally, there's the top of the atmosphere radiance, normalized water leaving radiance. And you can go model it to here, and then model it to here, and model it to here. You can sort of bypass any of them. And you can also go directly um, from, the, from the TOA radiance to component IOP. So if you, as you start to read the literature, just be clear in your mind which pathway they're going because you can bypass any of these steps. And I think it's important because each step has some um, inherent um, assumptions. Okay, so let's consider an ocean. 
that is, we're back to our absorbing ocean, the sea dom. And let's think about how, if we're thinking about the water coming out of the ocean, and we have a sea dom ocean, what is it that we're going to see? When we look over the side of the boat, if it's just sea dom. Hmm? It's black, right? Because sea dom is dissolved and therefore shouldn't have any scattering, right? Um, and if we ignored the fact that water actually has scattering, the ocean would, would, look black, would look black. But if the ocean had blue scattering, what might it look like? Small, you know, Rayleigh scattering. Yeah, so it would be definitely the blue light, which would be preferentially reflected, would be absorbed by the sedum. So the color that would come out would be probably something shifted much more towards the green, but it would still be pretty dark, right? Good. Um, okay, so now let's think of our scattering ocean, the coccolithic floors, um, and how is the reflectance going to depend on the backscattering? If we increase the amount of coccolithic floors, or we increase the amount of backscattering, what happens? It'll get blue and and yeah, and bright, right? The more stuff we put in the water, the brighter it's going to be. So we just have to think that since we're in some combination, um, that the absorbing material is making it darker, the scattering material is making it brighter. And so that immediately gives us this relationship that the reflectance that we're, that we're seeing is going to be somehow proportional to the backscattering of the absorption, right? And so even without any sort of theory, it's back to the, the heuristic model that Kurt's talking about, um, you know, you can really get a lot out, or you can really be predictive if you just really think about what's happening. And so as we increase absorption, it gets, lost, it gets darker. As we increase backscattering, it gets brighter. And so we can come up with sort of a mathematical equation of that. Okay, so I'm not going to go through this, but I'm putting it into um, the the file that you get, but it's basically the evolution of the single scattering albedo that Kurt talked about, the quasi-single scattering, and why we end up with this equation where, where reflectance is proportional to backscattering over absorption plus backscattering. So you can look at that and um, kind of merge it with the sort of more higher level theory um, that Kurt has presented as well. Okay. So so we know that with remote sensing reflectance, it's the ratio of the upwelling radiance over the downwelling E radiance, and it has units of steradians. And from Howard's, um, Gordon's uh, work, we know that um, you can express that measured quantity um, as the sum of two terms where you have two um, coefficients multiplied by this term u, which is the backscattering over the absorption plus backscattering. And so what it means is that you're going to have this term to the first power multiplied by g1 plus this term squared multiplied by g2. And typically, the values of g1 and g2 are spectrally independent. They've, um, whether that's actually true, um, this is a, uh, an approximation. Um, and often they ignore that second term. So people have done, gone and looked at what happens if you include the term, when can you include that squared term, and when can you ignore it. But recognize that most people just use the first term, and they use this as the multiplier. And so you notice that these all have units of per meter, and if this has units of per steradian, then this term has to have a unit of per steradian. So that tells you something about this term. It's got some dependence on angle. And so that is the term that we call F over Q. And you talked about, did you talk about F over Q? About what? F over Q? Uh, yeah, yeah. A little bit. Are we returning to it? Um, yes, I the answer is yes. Talk about it. Uh, in any detail, it's a standard output from hydrobite. We can see it there. Okay. Please do. Just it's a reminder to you, because I don't want to talk about it. All right, so questions. Do we have any questions? Well, if um, there's an increase in your ocean in the number of heterotrophic bacteria, what is going to happen to the reflectance? Mm 
just a question to get you make sure you're breathing. Less backscatter because they eat stuff and it turns into dissolved stuff. So there's a process that be, that they might be changing the material that's already there. So if they're eat moving, stuff. they yeah they tend to eat dissolved stuff. They also can latch on. But what do they personally do, in optically? So they're heterotrophic. So how big are they? Very small. What's their absorption spectrum look like? Which component would they show up in? Sedum, phytoplankton, non-algal particles. They're going to show up in non-algal particles. So they're going to have an absorption spectrum that probably looks something like this and a backscattering spectrum that looks something like this. And so you're going to have a ratio of these, right? And so it depends on whether they're more scattering or more absorbing. So I don't know the answer to that question, but someone should figure it out. And you could figure it out in hydrolyte. And that might be important because if you're in a lake and you have a lot of input of heterotrophic bacteria, can you monitor that with remote sensing? I don't know. That'd be a fun thing to be a fun project to think about. Okay. So I want to look at some um, early forward problems of IOP to reflectance. How many people have read this paper? Morel and Prier, 1977, Analysis of Variations of Ocean Color. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. I've read it probably 20 to 30 times. And every time I read it, I find myself saying, oh, yeah, that was so smart. This is just an amazing paper. And so we're going to go through it a little bit because I think you can learn so much about it. And also, you can just be reminded about how far ahead of the game they were at the time and how much we have not gotten too much farther. And so it's worth, it's worth going through. OK, so read this paper. Read it many times. Read it a couple of times throughout your graduate career and then afterwards. OK, so they measured the radiance reflectance. They had one sensor. They you know, measured the downward. They flipped it over and measured the upward. Um, and following the uh, quasi-single scattering approximation, they found that the coefficient the F over Q coefficient for irradiance reflectance was 0.33, which is different than it is for radiance, obviously, because radiance and irradiance are very different. So they had gone out and measured all of these reflectance spectra, and these are on a log-log plot as a function of wavelength. And you get this all of my, my advisor called this the spaghetti cl plot. You know, with just every line is in there. It looks like a tangle mass of spaghetti. But the goal of the paper was to see if they could explain the variations in the shape of the, of the reflectance curves with respect to absorption and backscattering. And so they wanted to figure out a way, because they did not have absorption meters and backscattering sensors, could they model the spectra um, to predict the shape and therefore learn something about the spectra? And this is the basis for basically all semi-analytic inversions. All right, so, whoa. That's funny. Um, ignore that for right now, those lines. Um, so the first thing that they did is they said, well, OK, we, can, we have some ability to measure scattering at certain wavelengths. And we know that that's going to be due to water and by particles, right? Those are the two things that are going to scatter light. And we also know that if we could measure backscattering, we know that that would be due to backscattering by water and backscattering by particles. It's pretty straightforward. And they said, well, we do know, because it was Andre Morel, <laughs> um, he did know that the backscattering um, by water could be predicted by this very steep dependence on wavelength, that very steep scattering, right? And that the backscattering by particles probably also has some sort of spectral dependence that you might be able to model based upon wavelength. And so what we didn't know was you know, what that um, coefficient that dependence is going to be. Okay, so they said, well, let's make some assumptions. Let's look at the 
fraction of, of backscattering that's due to water. Okay, so if all your backscattering is due to water, we're over here. If all your backscattering is due to particles, we're over here. Right? And then this is the blue to red ratio of backscattering. So essentially, they're looking at this slope. Well, you know that if you're all, all the way over here at water, your slope is going to be the slope due to water, right? And then the assumption is, well, if it's all the way over on this end, then your particles are dominating the backscattering slope. And like, how much can it vary? Well, so they were thinking that maybe it could vary from being flat for particles, right? Or it might have some dependence here where it's decreasing um, lambda to the minus one. And that's what these two values are here. And that any combination of the balance between water and particles in the contribution to backscattering is going to be somewhere along here. And so what you see is that there's just not a tremendous amount of variability between what kind of particle you have. And really, the big driver between here and here is whether you have a lot of particles or not very many particles, right? And that you could probably figure out. So that was pretty clever. OK, so when water dominates the slope, the backscattering slope is going to be really steep. And you could actually predict what the blue to red ratio is going to be, the slope, 14. And then as particles begin to dominate, the slope is, de is decreased. And, and again, don't confuse this with index of a fraction. It's not. It's just the coefficient that describes the spectral dependence. OK, so, so that, was a pretty good, that was a pretty good model. And really, now our only unknown is, is really this. OK. So then they said, all right, well, let's go out and let's make some Let's divide up all of our measured reflectance spectra and kind of group it. And so the first grouping that we're going to do is the pure water values. And if we know that we're in blue water, there's not much other stuff. We can say that all of our reflectance is driven by water and maybe some particles, and then absorption by water. So they're basically ignoring any sort of absorbing matter by non algal particles or phytoplankton or sedum. And so the only term that's going to vary is the particulate backscattering, and it's going to vary by whatever, basically, that is the indicator of size or that spectral dependence. OK, so here are all their spectra. So the black lines are the measured. And um, oh, no, these are the modeled ones. So they modeled the different spectra for different concentrations of particles and whether they are sloped with a flat spectral scattering or a, a slope spectral scattering. And then they took these modeled spectra and they applied it to Crater Lake and the Sargasso Sea where you have really, really blue waters. And so they found that their conditions T3 and T4 did a really nice job in predicting the shape of the curve that they measured, which was great. And all you needed were these, all, basically all you needed was this. <laughs> and so, um, that was pretty amazing to be able to get that forward model. And, and basically say that in clear waters, you can predict most of the spectral variability due to water and particulate scattering. So that, and, and they call that their case one. Okay. <coughs> then they said, okay, well, let's look at green waters. We're gonna call those the different case. We're gonna call that case two. This is the first description of case one and case two waters. And that has been blown into this whole, like, are you a case one or are you a case two? You know, and what's the definition of case one? What's the definition of case two? Go back and read their definitions. You see all this other stuff about case one and case two. But the original um, definition was like, well, we could model it with just water. We could had to add some chlorophyll to it. OK. So they had two types of case two waters. One is the V type. And that's what they called chlorophyll dominated. And they called it V because it was really an upside down V in terms of the shape of the spectrum. And they said, OK, well, now we've got to add phytoplankton 
into our absorption part of the thing. And we're going to model phytoplankton as a function of chlorophyll. And in fact, probably most of the particles that are in there are phytoplankton or related to phytoplankton. So we can model the particulate scattering also as a function of chlorophyll. And they came up with some relationships for that. Um, and so they modeled these spectra and they said, okay, when chlorophyll is really low, I'm going to have a spectrum that looks like this. And when chlorophyll is really high, I'm going to get a V here and I get a big V here. So it's kind of the double V, but not a W. Okay. So, and, and so they could, they could actually compare that to their measurements and, and do a really good job of modeling their sort of V type uh, spectra. Just again, having a chlorophyll based model for phytoplankton absorption and particle scattering. Their other type of green waters was this U type. And you notice that it's much more, much more curved in the shape. And these were waters that they knew were really sediment laden. And they said, okay, well, we we'll probably still have phytoplankton in these waters. Um, and we're still going to model our phytoplankton as a function of chlorophyll. But now probably our particles are not well predicted by the chlorophyll concentration, nor um, is the absorption by these particles. These particles are now going to be absorbing particles. And so this is where you come up with, you have constituents in your water that don't co-vary with chlorophyll. So it's a case two water, but it's a U-type case two water, which is very different from the case two water where everything varies with chlorophyll. So now if you start thinking about reading papers where they describe case one and case two, really the V type and the case one type are what we now call case one because it's clear waters where that where, you know, there's either no phytoplankton, it's just water, or it's water where all the optical properties can co-vary with chlorophyll. And these are the ones where they don't. Okay, yeah. That's reflectance. So they're presenting reflectance because it's EU over ED. They're presenting it as a percentage. So this is 0.1. It's a very bright water, um, but it's a log scale. So now they were modeling spectra by increasing chlorophyll and also increasing particles, and you could get really bright waters. Um, and in this case, um, the shape of the curve, again, on a log scale, depends on how much chlorophyll you have in the water. All right. So that's great. So then um, they modeled a variety of different cases where now the black line is the observed and the dotted line is the measured. And they're basically using this equation to forward model the reflectance. And they are assuming, um, they are assuming a backscattering ratio here for particles. It's flat, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And then they just, they just adjusted their scattering to match the reflectance at 550, and then the rest of the spectrum um, in this equation ended up matching the reflectance. And so if you look at this, their absorption is water, a specific spectrum of absorption for phytoplankton multiplied by chlorophyll and theophyton, some particulate absorption, probably non-algal particle and CDOM mixed together, but multiplied by some, some fraction of scattering. So the more scattering you had, the more particulate absorption you had. And then the backscattering is really just the backscattering ratio times the particulate scattering, and you add that to water. And so it was a really simple model, and it's one that a lot of people have used, and it does a great job to predict the spectral shape and magnitude of reflectance for a huge array of waters. So that was really exciting. Um, the crazy part about this paper to me is that then they go and they use that to predict chlorophyll. <laughs> so they've just modeled the IOPs, but everything back then was chlorophyll. So now they go through this whole um, example of how you can use the band ratio <laughs> to predict chlorophyll. So they got themselves out of the black box and then they kind of tucked themselves back in the black box of, of an empirical algorithm. But um, that was where we were moving at the time to try to get an algorithm for satellite. Okay, so what they saw was that, you know, you can have a ratio, but you can have a very broad range of chlorophyll for those values. So you have uncertainty in both. And really, 
what it says when you read this is that the variations in ocean color are really explained by more than just chlorophyll or any pigment concentration. And of course, we know that. We know that it's absorption and backscattering, and it's all the different components that are causing that spread. And in fact, now that's what we're interested in estimating. So it's good. And so the variations in the color can be explained by the composition of what's in the water. OK, questions? Go back and reread the paper. OK. Yeah. I'm not certain what your question is. Is your question, do we not know what the absorption by pure water is? So you just mean absorption. Because they have other constituents. Yes. Right. And so the question, I mean, really the question that you're asking is, how well do we know what sea dom absorption is and phytoplankton absorption and the non-algal particle absorption is? And in lakes, um, if you have really high concentrations of material, which you often do, you can get scattering, um, so much scattering that you actually get enhanced, you get, not enhanced, but you get scattering in the red before the penetration of light would um, absorb it due to water. And so you tend to get redder waters inland because you have a lot more particulate matter because everything's washing in. And so using that red signal, it's now not zero. Whereas when we look in the open ocean and we look, if we put on in our little red glasses and we went out and looked at the ocean, the ocean would look black because the light coming from the sun that's in the red wavelengths just gets absorbed because there's not enough scattering in most situations to scatter back out. But that's not true in lakes. And so in lakes, that red, the, the absorption by pure water, it's still absorbing the same as any, any other water in the world or universe. Um, but it's that you're now seeing red photons getting scattered before they get absorbed. And that's what happens in harmful algal blooms also. The waters tend to be red because you're scattering the red light and all the other light is being absorbed. It's not that they you know, have a red pigment. They're just scattering the solar spectrum, that part of the solar spectrum, before water can absorb it. Okay. All right, I think I had a question for you. All right, we have green water. We've got a lot of green water out here. And the ocean color algorithms are going to give us a chlorophyll value, as Kurt said. What else causes the green water? Sea dump. Yep, and so Kurt showed a really nice example from Wayne Slade's paper where the difference between the neural network approach and the um, standard algorithm was right along the coast where the rivers are coming in with all this sea dump. And so as we start thinking about these inversions, um, including things other than just phytoplankton in your absorption, allows you to separate out what's making the water green. And so in the winter in the Gulf of Maine, it's still green, but it's clear and green because it's got all this sea dump in it. And then in the springtime, it's turbid and green because it's got phytoplankton. And so um, algorithms that measure green are, have like many, many answers, many, many probably wrong answers. So, okay. So now let's look at some inversion approaches. All right. So back in the day, in the 90s, we had this equation. There's the F over Q, um, depending on your definition of reflectance, of being radiance or irradiance. Um, your F over Q can vary from 0.09 to 0.33, depending upon how you're making your measurements. But it turns out there was a, this sort of focus point in time when everybody started thinking about like, oh, we could invert this, right? And so like five papers all got published in about three years. <laughs> 
And this was right when I was finishing my PhD, or this was my PhD. And they all basically came out at the same time, and they all basically said the same thing, and none of the people had talked to each other. So it was sort of one of those things where the idea comes through, and everyone's like, hey, I, I know we can do this. And everybody did. It was actually a really exciting time. So here's how it works. You recognize that the inherent optical properties are additive, and so therefore you can separate them. And so you can separate your absorption, and you can separate your backscattering, and you now could measure spectra associated with each one of these. So you could, um, because of Cushino, you could separate out the phytoplankton from the non-algal particles on your filter pad, and then you could put a sample in your cuvette, and Anique Bercot showed us in 1986 that you can measure a really nice spectrum. Um, and then, you know, we've been improving our understanding of water. You could model using me theory because now me theory was being available to anybody with a computer. The code was, was written for you, so anybody could run it. It wasn't just, you know, me. <laughs> Not me, but as, you know, the other, the, the big guy, me. <laughs> I don't know, maybe he was short. But, you know, so then you could begin to model what the spectral dependence of these particles. So it was kind of, it was exciting. So you could put all of these, you know, spectra and you could imagine that various combinations of these will give you some absorption and various combinations of different sized particles and water are going to give you some backscattering spectrum. So then, of course, we recognize that because of Beer's law, we could take each one of these components and we could define some spectral shape for it as a first approximation. And then Basically, we're separating the spectrum of one of our components, say phytoplankton, and we could say, well, if we had some specific absorption coefficient, and we assumed that that spectrum was pretty constant, then really the only thing that we have to do is figure out how much to add in there, right? And so you're basically taking each one of the components and saying it's a scalar times a vector, and that's really a magnitude and a spectral shape, or it's an eigenvalue, eigenvector. Right. So, and this is out of Jeremy Wardell's, you can kind of go through this, and in fact, um, what we also noticed is not only, I mean, later, it wasn't just one phytoplankton spectrum, but if you knew you had a bunch of different types of phytoplankton, you could come up with one of these curves for diatoms and one for dinoflagellates, and one for cryptophytes. And maybe you could come up with one for big diatoms and one for small diatoms, because one's going to be flattened and one isn't. Right? So you could imagine that you could break this phytoplankton into um, a set of 10 different phytoplankton. Right? Um, that didn't come till much later. And you could do the same thing for CDOM if you had different kinds of different, you know, tannins or proteins or different types of sedum and also potentially different kinds of non-algal particles, living versus dead non-algal particles. So, you know, you can really expand this out um, depending upon how many wavelengths you have. And so this is where we're heading with hyperspectral is that we can do a lot better here. And I'm going to show you an example of looking at multiple different phytoplankton spectra and also maybe even breaking it into pigments you could just begin to put different pigments in there. So it gets kind of exciting. Anyway, you put it all together, and you end up with backscattering over absorption plus backscattering. So there's backscattering over absorption plus backscattering. And we're going to assume that we know, oh, that should be BBW, sorry. God, how many times have I looked at this? Um, that is, these are known, the water optical properties. The eigenvectors are some spectrum that we're going to identify the shape of, right? And what's the shape of non-algal particle absorption? Yep, the universal symbol for exponential. CDOM <laughs> absorption, a little bit steeper, right? Um, phytoplankton, yep, perfect. Yeah, so you guys are there. <laughs> um, and so... You know, again, if you wanted to use sums of them, you would just have different phytoplankton. So maybe, you know, one smaller and whatever. You'd have different spectra, um, different slopes of sedum, things like that. Okay. So, so now what we have to do is we have to define these spectra. So we have to come, we have to 
nail it down, come up with a shape that we're happy with. And then um, you make a measurement, which you guys have done. So you guys have done this, and you've done this, and you've done this, and you've done this, <laughs> and you've done this. Right, you've made spectra. You've come up with, you could come up with some characteristic spectra for the samples that you've done in labs, right? And you've done this with the HyperPro, right? So if you have a characteristic spectrum for each one of these and you have a measurement of reflectance, you can estimate the magnitude of each one of these by regression, by, a, by some sort of you know, minimization, some cost function. And then once you've estimated how much phytoplankton and how much non-algal particle and how much particle backscattering you need to put together in B back over A plus B back, you end up with a reflectance spectrum. And then you compare it to the one you measured. Because there's going to be some error, even in a least square sense, right? So it looks like this. You measure reflectance spectrum, and then you say, all right, well, this is what water backscattering looks like. This is what the particle backscattering looks like. Emmanuel measured a billion of these over on the tar emissions and found that the slope is about, what, 0 0.7? 0 0.8. 0 0.8. Yeah, so it's got some spectral dependence over the globe. I'm going to use that shape. And I've got, you know, I measured this in 1989. Why don't I, I should just keep using it, right? It's fine. Um, CDOM and non algal particle. And then you're just adjusting those to reconstruct that. And in fact, I'm going to have you do that this afternoon by hand, right? And you'll, be, you'll look at this and be like, well, I've got some phytoplankton in there because there's a nice dip at 440. So I have to have phytoplankton absorption, right? So you can just start adding little bits in. Okay, so. Oh, yeah, and sometimes people ignore the backscattering down here. Okay, so all these papers that came out were basically all doing the same thing. The differences between them are in how they define the eigenvectors or those spectral shapes that you're putting into the model. What was the shape of their phytoplankton absorption? How steep was the spectral slope of their CDOM? Um, and those are the big differences between them. And so, for example, the phytoplankton ones are really different. So this was the spectrum that I used, that I had measured. It was an average of a bunch of samples from Puget Sound from when I took the class in 1989. That was my project. <laughs> um, this is, uh, these are the spectra that Lee uses in QAA. And he uses, basically he has a mathematical function that defines these two Gaussians separated by a line. And he's got like high and low, for high and low concentrations. Mara Terena had an original, this was a Burko spectrum and a Morel spectrum, but then it didn't, it didn't fit the results very well, so he optimized it, which made him end up with like a really strongly peaked absorption. It looks like this. And the specific absorption coefficients are quite high. These are all specific absorptions. So this is QAA. This is mine, and this is um, Martirena's. And they, he was only going out. He was only going out into the um, into the green, so he didn't have the spectrum going all the way through to the red. And what you see here is that these are not tremendously different on this scale, right? This one has some features to it. There's not really any features here, but essentially they're about the same shape. Okay, and then they also differ in their inversion <coughs> method. Some are uh, nonlinearly square, some are an optimized nonlinearly square, some is, are linear matrix inversion, some of them fit by eye. I'm not kidding. I'm not telling you who this is. You can figure it out when you read their papers. You will be so surprised. <laughs> um, like it looked like it fit. I added enough of these together. It looks like it was a good fit. <laughs> I did it in Excel. This was not me. But you get to do this. Okay. Um, and then the other diff a difference is how they validated or didn't validate their results and what error analysis they did and the sophistication of the error analysis. Um, whether they, the model was validated with independent data or data that they used to derive the model. Again, 
I'm not kidding. They, you use your data, you derive a model, and then you test it against the same data. That is just not good. Um, and you know how broad a range were they tested over? So um, we have the papers in the library, and you should read them. And kind of, I read them side by side because I find each of them has some really good things to offer, and then each of them you cringe, including my own, my own model. I cringe. Okay, so do that. All right, so I'm not going through each of them. I have it at the end of the PowerPoint, which you guys will have posted, but this is how. So I'm going to show you how one of them works. First, I'm going to ask you a question. What's the measured quantity in the equation? And what are we trying to invert for? We're measuring R, right? And we're inverting to get A and B. Everybody's very sleepy today. That's why I keep putting these in, just to make sure you're like right with me. <laughs> All right, so here's an example of one of the early models. It's mine, because it's the one I know the best. All right, so the eigenvectors that I used, this is the water, it's constant. I modeled with two different size particles, a large one, which has spectral independence. Basically, it says that QB, B is two, no. It's not two, but it's as if the particle were large and independent of wavelength. Smaller particles, I think I modeled with a lambda to the minus one. Now the interesting thing is, is that when you end up with estimates of both of them, if you add them together, it allows you to get any sort of spectral dependence, right? It could solve for a lot of this one and a little bit of this one, so you could maybe get minus 0.75, right? So it allows for a range of spectral dependence in the backscattering without explicitly solving for this, which turns out to be kind of tough to do. It, it ends up being not well posed in the inversion. And then I said, okay, well, as a first guess, I'm going to combine these two because the difference in spectral shape due to this compared to an exponential. And so I came up with some average. Later, I kept them separated with different slopes, but again, you can, f you can make modifications there. These were the reflectance spectra that I measured. I got to go on four cruises. My first cruise was the Gulf of Maine, which but these spectra over here, and I just came back to the Gulf of Maine. It's kind of interesting. I just, my first research cruise with my advisor. Um, and all the rest were west coast. So the chlorophyll range was 0.07 to 25, huge range in chlorophyll concentration, huge range in phytoplankton absorption coefficients, and a huge range in backscattering coefficients. And so I pulled out some extreme examples from each one of these environments. And you can see that like, the oceanic ones are very bright. The estuary ones, this is Puget Sound, are really dark. So I ran the model and came up with some Chinese symbols here. Cool. I ran the model. The model is in black. The measured is in co the colored spectrum. And it's the same model. There's no tuning. All you're doing is estimating the various concentrations or contributions of each one of the components to recon to by a least square sense, right? So when, this, when we first ran this, it was pretty shocking to me that you don't have to tune <laughs> when you're not doing empiricism, right? And that just by varying it, even with the assumptions on the shape of the curves being so rigid, that you can explain this huge range of shapes and magnitudes, right? That's pretty encouraging because that says that you can explain all of that variability with a really, really simple model. So one of the interesting side things is, of course, the model doesn't have um, fluorescence in it. And so that, but the measurement does. So the model predicts the re reflectance that you would get in the absence of natural fluorescence. So it turns out this is a really nice way to separate the fluoresced contribution to light. And in fact, when you have really high absorption, most people would just draw a straight line across it. 
Um, but there's actually a lot of feature in there. And so if you wanted to integrate, you would want to integrate the difference between those two curves. And I just wanted to show you what that looks like. Um, these, that is what I did for all of the different environments. And you can see you get, you know, different magnitudes and some, you know, suggestion of reabsorption for some of them. And so the shape of that curves can tell you a lot. And I think there's been relative, manual I've talked about, there's relatively little work exploiting natural fluorescence and the fluorescence line height from remote sensing. And, you know, being able to model a spectrum now with hyperspectral to be able to estimate that spectrum. There's a, probably a lot of information there. Yeah. They're doing it now? Yes. Excellent. I'm happy to hear that. <laughs> yeah. Bioluminescence. So, in the blue. Um, so one of the things about bioluminescence. So bioluminescence is we didn't talk about it, but it's like a really long decay time. Um, and I, I mean, so I don't know. Would it show up in here? Maybe. Do you know any studies? No. This was my question. I don't know anyone who's doing it, and I don't know whether the signal is strong enough. It's certainly strong enough at night when there's no other light and you see it. So it's stimulated by a chemical reaction. But I don't know, Ken, do you know? No, but I don't think you ever see it in the day. Not in the daytime. Well, I know, they never, they never published anything, really. I mean, they pu about the bioluminescence and during, the during the daytime. Yeah. It's a lot of work in because submarines would light up. <laughs> Right, it was funded by the Navy, and so they needed to know that. But during the day, I don't know if you'd see it. You could model it. Yeah, I, you can include bioluminescence and hydrolyzers. Yeah. We're not going to bother with it in here, but yeah, it can be done. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, I think this advisory is that in the class, they would probably do bioluminescence, and then they would do every advisor. When you took the class, he did? Yes. And, and how, how would you say you propagate if you have a diver? Uh, what did he find? Detection level, and then he ended up publishing. I think he said you could, like, yeah, I don't know if it was from space or something. But or from somebody above water. It was, like, talk about target. And oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, you could, you could determine where a target was from bioluminescence. Cool. Yeah, <laughs> target. <laughs> there's, there's two sides to your last result that you can model things so well. The one I just looked before that, all the different waters. Yeah. Rigid. I mean, the one side is great, you can model all these things. Secondly, is how much more information can you get? So, <laughs> so, what I end up talking about is that there are places where it doesn't model well, right? And so, if you look at the residual, that's the extra set of information, right? So you can do a really good job in the big, big picture of the spectrum, just with any old phytoplankton and you know a basic stuff. But there's actually a tremendous amount of information here, okay? And so that's where I think we can exploit something more, right? But you have to. Those are little signals, and you have to do a really good job with your atmospheric correction. But one of the things that you hope is that your atmospheric correction has smoothly varying spectral features compared to pigments, right? So if I look at this, I got, that's a, that suggests to me that the um, model did not have enough absorption in that, that pigment range, right? This one is sort of, if the difference between those two looks exponential to me. So it could be backscattering or CDOM that the model did not have quite the right basis vector. But, but looking at the, well, I'll show you, because I'll show you what that difference looks like. But that's where I think the exploitation comes in. And so then the question is, can you resolve that through atmospheric correction if your atmospheric correction is a smoothly varying spectral error? OK. So um, the first thing to, um, val to validate, validate, your model, every model needs to be validated. Make sure when you're reading papers, just scan for the word validate, because a lot of them have zero validation. So we c I could estimate chlorophyll.